Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you with great joy and thanksgiving for this day you give to us. We thank you for the more comfortable uh, weather, and uh, we pray your blessing upon us now. Shine down upon us uh, with the radiance of your grace, that we might come to grow in thy word and uh, to living it to thy honor and glory. For Jesus' sake we pray this. Amen. Okay, just kind of a recap of everything we've done thus far, we're getting close to the end. I, I finished working on this the other day, so I could be on vacation. But what, what, if you remember what happened in the book, he starts off by praising. He's praising the people as he's heard about their faith, their commitment to Christ. He's praising them. And that always, it, it always helps if you're going to do something you put a positive note on it. If I come, because there are people, you know, you come to the church and, and they come to your office and you know, oh, not again. Because <laughs> you know, they only come when it's bad. Okay, but so, so he offers this praise and thanksgiving. Then he identifies Christ. He speaks of Christ to be the true Son of God, the Savior of the world. Important because the Judaizers don't believe the Gnostics don't believe this. So he shows the identity of Christ. Then he emphasizes, now you people, you're alive in him. You're not dead to sin. You're alive in Christ. Now you got to get excited, Pat. we got to get excited because we are alive in Christ. Okay, and then he goes on and says, but now be careful. Just because you're alive in Christ doesn't mean that everything is absolutely secure with you. Because the onslaughts of the evil world through which Satan works, it is uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And so be careful. And then he admonishes them. Well, put, you know, put Christ on. Live in Christ. Dwell in God's word. And then, in the part we're in now, he says, and now, this is the life you live in Jesus Christ. This is what your life is to look like. Because you're a new person. The old person is gone. The new person has arisen. Any comments? Okay. I, amen. Let's go home. So, verse, verse 11 now. This is where he's, he's talking about putting on, living the new life. Then in verse 11 of chapter 3, he says, Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Now what he's doing here, he's considering the, the different backgrounds. And not all these backgrounds are necessarily uh, visible in the city of Colossae, but they're in the world. And so he's saying, first of all, there is neither Greek nor Jew. Now the Greek here isn't like an unbeliever. This is talking more in the sense of a very intellectual person. Like, when I think of Greek, I think of philosophy. Okay? So a very intelligent person, very high social standing. So if a person has, is intelligent, you know, got a doctor's degree. See, because sometimes what we do is that, well, you know more than I do because you got a doctor's degree. That's not actually true. Right? You know more about some things. About some things, maybe, yes. But, but sometimes, when I married my first wife, uh, her mother told me, he said, she said, you're marrying Einstein. She is really smart intellectually. But practically, she's going to do something. So, and I'm not criticizing her, but she was the worst subject. Only one she never got A in was PE. She was not a pilot. Everything else, A, 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 A. See, no problem. Very intelligent. But sometimes you can be intelligent, not practical, right? So anyway, but these are the Greeks are the intellectual, high society people. The Jews are probably more maybe in low middle income, but then their concept is in religious, religious things, right? And, and not the intellectual. 
the, the, the Greeks would analyze religion and become philosophical. Okay, right? So, like for example, in the Bible we have body, soul, and spirit. Philosophy talks about the id, ego, and super ego. Right? Okay, then you've got circumcised and uncircumcised. We've talked about that one. Barbarian is one who could not speak Greek and was thought to be uncivilized. Okay? He wasn't really connected with society. Was, I don't know what you would classify him as today. I didn't try to figure that one out. But he's, a, he's one who couldn't speak Greek, so he's not considered very intelligent. And at the same time, he's, he's not very civilized, okay? So uh, I suppose maybe in our culture, we have cultural things that we do, right? Um, I don't know. We wash hands before we eat or whatever, and they may not do those things. I'm hungry. Yeah, okay. But then you've got the Scythians, and these are known for their brutality. And they're considered wild beasts, and they were actually, interestingly, uh, they came from what is known today as southern Russia. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So, but these are these are wild beasts, the Scythians, you know, you gotta really watch out for them. Maybe the barbarians, you could say, maybe you could say the people on the street. How would that be? That might fit pretty good. But, but you got all these different classes, and now notice, what Paul says. In the church there is no difference. For in Christ we are all one. Okay? There isn't one who is more intelligent or less intelligent. Or, this doesn't matter anymore. We are one in Christ. The important part of this all is, even for Calvary or St. Paul's, is to sit there and say, when I'm dealing with a fellow member, this is a brother or sister in Christ. This is where it starts. Okay? We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, we had an episode one time of a really tough meeting, and I remember coming in, and I, it was a round table, and I put the cross right in the middle. And I said, if you don't see this other person through the cross of Calvary, you got trouble. Okay. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I have one sister, and she's always wrong, but I don't let her know that because I'm a nice guy and we're one in Christ. I'm just teasing again. <laughs> you know. Okay. But, but the concept is really important here. We're one in Christ, and you don't look down on someone. Okay? You don't, and you don't think of yourself more highly. You, we are one in Jesus Christ. Okay? Whatever your background is bad, we're one in Christ. Um, okay, any comments on that? All right, Romans, uh, Romans, Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Now he goes on with some more spiritual admonition. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Now stop right there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for raising your hand. And waving. I appreciate that. <laughs> so is this, are these people, um, they're being talked about in Colossia, that means they're Christian, they accept Jesus? Yes, Christ. yes, they would be Christians. Right, they're Christians, right. So would this be a case for praying with anybody who's a Christian? Every, anybody who's a Christian? Well, I, I, yes, I, I guess so. That would be, I, I suppose you could say that. Yeah. They were from the church. They were from the church in Colossus. And we, you know, we, we can't claim it was Lutheran Catholic, but you know, but yes, yeah. But yes, they're one, in, they're, they're united in Christ. And this is the, well, even, <clears throat> I think, this is very important. The church, I drew that diagram the other day of a donut, if you remember, with the denominations. It's very important that we might understand. Um, I know some pastors in Bremen that I wouldn't want people to go to their church because they'll never see Christ, even though it's a holy Christian church. But there's others who I know they will see Christ. 
They don't agree doctrinally necessarily, and I'm not going to say we would ignore the difference in doctrine, but that pastor is still a brother in Christ because he's still part of the holy Christian church. Now, we, we have our differences, yes, and we can talk about that, but we're still one in Christ. Yeah, because the church is bigger than the Lutheran Church of Missouri City. No. <laughs> oh, Cindy. All right. So, I hope that answered that question, but it's, yes. But again, thinking, just thinking about that, if you, if you know a good Christian brother or sister, I mean, it can be even Catholic, and, and, and not even Catholic, I guess, bad, but they're, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. They trust in Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They are brother or sister in Christ. We not don't agree on everything, and we're not going to ignore our disagreements, but we still are one in Christ. Because the, the interesting thing we have in the world today is if we stand divided in our fight, and I'm not talking about joint worship service or anything like that, please, but if we, if as Christians we do not unite in Christ to do battle against the world, then we will fight against each other and the world's going to knock the Christians off. Simple as that. Right? I remember in the in a Bremen years ago, because I never went never went to the Ministerial Association because they basically worked on um, joint worship services. So that was a waste of time. But one time they, they were going to work on, we had a tavern in town that was uh, doing some of the skate stuff. And so I worked with them on that. Have you been there, huh? <laughs> I haven't. Well, I took a stop. But the point was, the church, the Christian church gathered together to address that issue. Now, if the Christian church is fighting against each other, then that just keeps spreading agreement. Okay, so that's, a, that's an important, I mean, it's an important part. We have to remember, you know, we, we stand for doctrine, we uphold our doctrine. I'm not saying that at all, okay? But also, we still are presenting Christ Jesus to the world. All right? All right. No argument. So, now we go back. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. We stop right there. Because now, again, what Paul does, before he talks about us living out our faith, he says, remember your identity. <laughs> kind of interesting, because Pastor Almeyer said he's going to talk about this identity thing. Okay. Notice, Paul says this is your identity. You are God's chosen one. Now, key here, we are not his because we chose him. We are his because he chose us. And he did that not because we were great. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, okay? So, the concept here is God, it, uh, God chose us not so not so that we are to be holy or to become his children. He chose us, making us his children. The choosing makes us his children. It's not something that will come to be. It is now. And that's important again because the Colossae Christians are going to be dealing with all these the Judaizers who say, hey, you got to be circumcised here, buddy. Physical circumcision, okay? No, God chose me. I am his, okay? So, I just have two verses here. One I want to look up, but the other one, it's, it comes in the, uh, the uh, interesting, it comes in the uh, chapter where Jesus talks about the vine and the branches. Okay? And he talks about, if you don't bear fruit, I cut you off. Otherwise, I prune you. I'm going to need some trouble. Okay? But then in, in verse 16 of John 15, he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide. So notice, we, we, he, we're not going about a process of being chosen. We are chosen, and we're chosen to bear fruit, be fruit bearers for Christ. That's our sanctification, so to speak, okay? Justified, we're justified. God chose us to be his own. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The other verse I want to look at, because it, uh, we can use it again later, is Ephesians 1. 
since that's Paul's, and since it's not very far away from Colossians. Ephesians 1, um, verses 3 through 7. And he's talking again about he chose us. So he's telling this to the Christians at Ephesus. And, and, and notice again, we talked about this at the opening of Colossians. In the opening of Colossians, it said to, to the saints at Colossae. Here it says to the saints who are in Ephesus. You notice, we don't become saints. We don't get designated as saints sometime after we live this, this certain life. God says, I made you saints. I chose you. You are saints. Now that's kind of odd. I, I, we don't have to go through an electoral process. Okay? I don't have to come up with a bunch of delegates on my side. Okay? So here it is. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. He does the blessing in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he, here it is, shows us in him before the foundation of the world. Wow! Before the world was created, we were already chosen to be his children. In 2024. That is just awe-inspiring. It reminds me of, a, and I think maybe I share this already, but when Deborah was looking around at colleges, we went to Indiana Wesleyan, she said, I wouldn't be a math teacher. He said, well, I don't know if you're going to be a math teacher or not. We'll figure that out as you go through the educational process here. He said, but if you're going to be a math teacher, he said, I don't get this. I don't understand it. But God's already got your students lined up. And it's true, right? He governs all things. So long before we ever existed or our ancestors, he chose us. That's awesome stuff. Okay? He chose us to be his own uh, before the foundation of the world that we should, notice again, be holy and blameless before him. He chose us to be fruit bearers. Now, not that we were fruit bearers. We were dead trees. But he somehow made us alive. Okay, we can't make a dead tree alive, but he can do it because he's God. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Tremendous love with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. You can stop right there. So anyway, here you've got this whole concept again. He chose us before we were. So he's telling the Colossi Christians, understand this. God made you his own. He chose you. And then it says, holy and blameless are beloved. So we weren't holy, okay? We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Romans 6 says God sh shows us love for while we were still sinners, he loved us. We were lost. But Jesus came and by the blood of Jesus Christ we've been cleansed of all sin. Tremendous. <laughs> and, and think about that with all the debt that's in the world today. That would be like God saying, Oh, the United States, you don't have any debt in your treasury. Mm -hmm. Because I made you my own. Now he's not, that, that's an illustration, okay. We, we are not necessarily on God's side, but that's just an illustration, okay. And then beloved, we are loved by God. So one of the things we have to do as we go through our life and as we go through situations or, or particularly struggles, Stop at the foot of the cross. Are you loved? And look at the cross. Okay? It's just like, um, I was sharing with you when I broke my son's arm. Same thing, principle. I, I, uh, I wasn't mean that father. The, um, um, we were up in Wisconsin for my niece's baptism. 
wife and I were sponsors. And anyway, on a Sunday afternoon, we would play the man scream the basket. And my brother in law's got two brothers, so it's four of us. And Andrew was in first grade, and there were kids, they were running around, and I said, Stay off the driveway to play on the man scream the basket. Well, Andrew lost the ball in his play, and he ran onto the cement driveway. I was backing up, caught a pass. I, I hit him. My knees buckled. I fell down. Okay. <laughs> he gets up. He says, Dad, I think I sprained my wrist. I was like this. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we go to the emergency room, and uh, 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 going through all this, I, I'm apologizing. I'm saying, I'm sorry. I broke your arm. He said, Dad, it's not your fault. I was in the driveway. Well, technically, it was an accident, right? It was just an accident. But Satan doesn't like accidents. Satan said to Roger, if that arm doesn't heal, you fell on it. Look at the medical report. How did he break his arm? Father fell on him. Okay, it was his dominant arm. It's a dominant arm. Okay, so, oh man. And anyway, so I felt all this guilt. Come back to breathing. Somebody asked me to do a prayer, and I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to talk to him. I know my son's arm. And if it doesn't heal, and he lives to be 65, I did it for 65 years. See? Okay? So, finally one day I was sitting, I remember sitting at my desk, and I don't know, I hear voices. Whatever you think. And Jesus said, Roger, I got one question for you. Okay, did I die for you on the cross? Uh, yes, but... Oh, Roger, there's no buts here. Either I paid for your sins on the cross, or I didn't. So if I paid for your sins on the cross, whether that arm heals or not does not matter, because you're forgiven. Oh, I can't tell you what good I felt. You start preaching against them. But then... We go to the doctor's office in, in Bremen, or in South Bend. He's got a cast on. He's a boy, right? So he, he said, the doctor said, it's healing fine. It'll actually be stronger than the other arm. <laughs> so we go home out to the doctor's office, and the loved Andrew walks on a curb. And he lost his balance and fell on his arm. <laughs> now, the very first thing Satan does is this. Roger, if it doesn't heal, it's your fault. And right away the Lord was there, Roger, the cross says it's all paid for. And that's what I'm talking about here. When we question love or forgiveness, stop at the cross of Calvary and ask, if you're not loved by God and if you're not forgiven by God, what's Jesus doing up there? The cross of Calvary will give us strength assurance and hope. Okay? And that's what he's instilling in them. He's telling them, you guys are loved. God chose you. He's made you his saints, holy, and you're loved by him. And if you go back to the Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, okay. Well, that was a little story, but it was a story because I, I, Years before that, I was wondering how people couldn't, why couldn't they just believe Jesus forgave them? And then all of a sudden, there I am. You know, and you say, take eat Christ's body for the forgiveness of sins. I'm sitting there saying, Wah. you know, because Satan has a view day. He wants us to question and doubt the true significance of the cross of hell. Any comments? Okay. Oh, it's just so well. Okay. So, okay, so he says that, that you're holy and you're chosen once, holy and beloved. And now he comes on and he talks about because this is your identity. Okay, you're chosen, holy, and beloved. This is what your life should look like. Okay, because you, I don't, I don't do this a lot, but Loretta does this all the time. She looks at a baby and she 
Well, that looks just like their mother. Got this kind of ear, these kind of nose. <laughs> okay, I think it's a cute baby. But anyway, we do that. People do that, right? <laughs> Yesterday we were babysitting for one of my sons, and uh, the, the older boy was talking, and where I said, You sound just like your dad. <laughs> Not me, but my, my son, yes. But anyway, so the idea here is, no, this is what we are to be like because of what Christ has made us. First of all, compassionate hearts. Tender, caring, feeling hearts. Uh, but not, not, not like a feeling like I, I can put myself in that situation. I can't understand it. Please understand it. You can't understand. You lose a spouse, and somebody says, well, I understand. They never lost a spouse. I don't know what it's like. Okay. I don't know what it's like to lose a child. I don't know that. For me to say I do, I don't. Okay. But anyway, the compassion is to, to be tender-hearted, caring about this person. Not the expression, they made their bed. Let them deal with it. If the Lord had said that to us, we'd be going to hell. You made your bed, deal with it. You try to get yourself out of hell. But Jesus had compassion on us. He was tender-hearted, caring. Kindness is acting in a way that will benefit the other person. Okay, that's really... Compassion is the kind of what moves us. The kindness displays itself. And, and we do what will benefit another person. Now, very important, just have to say this, that doesn't mean we do everything that the person wants. It means we do what is beneficial for them. Okay? Um, and I, it's kind of interesting because when, you, when your kids get older and they have kids and you're a smart parent, it, took, it takes like one generation to get this down. Because they thought I enjoyed having disciplining my kids. Dad, you just like to do this. Now they know I don't because now they're dealing with it. Okay. So, kindness, humility. This is a big one. Let's turn to Philippians 2, to the book before, since that was written by Paul. Philippians 2, uh, verses 5 through 8. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. This is what, where the heart of humility is spoken, really. So, um, here the Lord is talking through uh, Paul to the people of Philippi. And he says, in the beginning of verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's the definition of humility. Okay? Now when you think about that, and that's, this is what's always um, kind of intrigued me. Loretta knows I'm this way. Not that I would do something dangerous, but if you challenge me to something, and I know well, I can do it, I'm going to do it. Don't challenge me. I don't really want to do it, but, you know, although she's never challenged me to make a good meal, I don't know why. But anyway, <laughs> the concept here, I, I think of this so easy, because here's Jesus with all the power to do. He's performing miracles. He's raising people from the dead. He's feeding the five thousand. He's doing all this stuff. And on the cross, he doesn't even try to save himself. Now he had it all, and that's what really intrigues me. Look, I can just see this, this soldier telling me, Roger, if you are the son of God, you know, I come down from the cross and I'll believe you. I say, oh, baby, I'll show you. <laughs> Jesus didn't do it. Because it, it wasn't his job. He was compassionate and kind to you and me. And in humility, he acted as if he was a helpless man. That is tremendous. Because it really, 
took away his recognition, right? I mean, if he, if he would have got off that cross, boy, people would have started ruining this man. But he didn't, because that was not his purpose for coming. His purpose for coming was to save the world. So in kindness, he did what was beneficial for us. And he humbled himself. And so when we think of humility, hard thing, it's not about me. It's about the other person. Today's world thinks so much about domination and power and self-recognition. And the Lord says, humility, those are my people. They are humble. They do a job, and they do it not to be recognized, but to be a servant who's been shaped and molded by the love of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, it's so interesting because man sees humility as a weakness. God sees it as the great display of power. So, um, no one's beneath us. Everybody is above us. And that, um, I, I've been thinking about when I start to do the after New Year, when I've been thinking about doing the Bible study on um, the events in the upper room since it come, coming into Lent. And uh, this, this one where um, you know, Jesus says, who is the greatest? You know, they're asking who's the greatest disciple. He says, it's the one who's a servant of all. That's the greatest. It's totally upside down. Do you understand that? In our world today, the top earth dog is considered to have all these servants. God says the greatest servant of the kingdom of God is the one who's serving everybody. Totally opposite. That's why we have so much trouble in, with living out the Christian faith because it's, it's totally it's even contrary to our very being. That's not who we are. It's about me, my, or I guess now. <laughs> I hear you can't refer to somebody as a he or she. We've got to say them. I saw this debate. And the person said, well, wait a minute. You can't be a them. You're only one. <laughs> That's improper English. <laughs> anyway, so humility. Meekness. <laughs> Meekness means not to not boastful even when we're humble. Now look by that, that's what I mean. See, we can we can be very humble. And then we can get done with something. Like, Boy, you know I was really good at that. I was really humble. Nobody knows about it. Well your meekness is just shot. <laughs> okay, meekness is just not wanting to be recognized, not looking for recognition or attention. And, and very, again, very important. And I always have been an envious kind of, of uh, people who could serve in the church, and the people in the church didn't know they were serving. That's, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, I know that's what you're supposed to do, but see, I can't, a pastor can't get away with serving and not being noticed. I mean, that's, that's impossible. But uh, I know my first wife, she always refused. Um, and I, I said, well, I'd like to put your name in the bulletin you're playing the flute because everybody turns around and looks and play, try and play. And she said, I don't want to be recognized. I don't want to be recognized. Under the carpet. Okay. Next one is interesting. Patience. This has nothing to do with a doctor. It has to do with the patient. And the, the, seriously, the, the, the exact definition here is long-suffering. It, it, the emphasis is not on, I can wait a long time. It is, I will endure difficulties for a long time. Okay? So it means, I will continue to offer service even when I am ridiculed or unjustly treated. I mean, do you like that when somebody is a critical? I mean, I've done that already. When, uh, you know, if we had somebody who was critical of one board once, and so the next time the nominations came on, I said, we're putting him on the board. And his attitude changed to that for that board. Because you don't understand something until you're actually doing it, right? But the idea here is, 
I will continue to go, no matter how much I get attacked. And you think about all of the disciples, with the exception of Judas, but all the other disciples, it was known for long suffering. Okay? They just kept the faith. And then bearing with one another is meaning uh, sticking with another person for help and support. Bearing with them, not giving up on them. That's hard too. And again, there, there's, a, there's a connection here with, it's so hard, and again, it almost feel an individual case, because you have, you cannot help someone, I just lost the word, um, you cannot, uh, I lost the word, you, you don't know what the word is, uh, um, can't. that's old age, um, no, it's not old age, that's not the word. Um, facilitate, facilitate. You not to facilitate something. You when you enable them when they you're hurting them. Okay, and that is very hard. It's very hard in a time of illness. Okay, because you know like I think I mentioned when Jerry was sick, the boys said my kids said to me, uh, why don't you get a handicap? thing and put it on the mirror. I said, because I want mom to walk for as long as she can. Because once she, she won't walk, she's never going to be able to walk again. Now, it wasn't being mean, and she never complained, mind you, never complained about it at all. But there's the concept of enabling. You, we're, we're not talking about enabling you, we're talking about helping. See? And, and so a lot of the stuff that, that happens now, that I, I, uh, I well, I I get the political realm, but see, to me, the government paying for government or for tuition for the students is totally wrong. Okay, they, I, you can give a grant or whatever, but to pay, I know students who have gone to school to party for four years. <coughs> I know of students that did that. So the idea is we don't enable. So you have to. To me, a lot of the personal help we are to give cannot be done on a government level, it has to be done on a level level. Because how do I know I can best help this person? And I'm not talking about, I'm not trying to be government now, but really, seriously, um, you know, when people come in, and you've had people come to the church here, and they come in and they say, I need something. Okay, do you really need something? Am I helping you if I, if I get you something? We had somebody, when I was at St. Paul's was. It was really interesting because she brought a baby again, too, and a guy, and they wanted some help, some financial help. And I said, so, well, where are you from? Well, we're from the northern part of South Bend. I said, you drove past tons of churches. How did you come, why did you come all the way to Bremen if you were running short of money? And I didn't get a good enough answer, so it didn't help. Okay. And I, then I always feel guilty after a while because I think, well, what if it's, <laughs> what if it's the, the Samaritans? But, but on the other hand, I had one guy once, he, he lied to me, and I looked at his briefcase, and I asked his name, well, the thing on the brief, the letters on the briefcase were not who he said he was. And anyway, we went on, and I said, well, we help at Hope Rescue Mission. I'll take you up there. Oh, you can't do that on the blacklist. <laughs> he already used the Risk. So this is a very, it's a very difficult thing. I'm not trying to say we make judgments, but as we talk about this, you know, bearing with one another, it is, but, but always try to keep Christ's love there. But Christ didn't always help. He did not take Paul's Lord of the flesh away. Okay, and anyway, do you have any comments on that? I, it's, a, it's a really tough, and I, when I do, sometimes I sit there and I'm like, was that the right thing? But then it's also interesting that St. Paul's when would help somebody, and I never gave him money. Um, I remember one guy was, they, they put him up in the hotel in town, that guy owner was paying for it, and I said, okay, well, you can have, I don't know, it's 10 or 20 dollars of food. I said, but no alcohol, no tobacco. And I went with him and um, made sure what he purchased was acceptable. Okay. But, because uh, money is, the, well, that's where you're totally out of line. You can't do anything. They can use it any way they want. 
Uh, but anyway, it's a tough question. It's a tough. And I think it's meant to hurt us because we have to question. Because we are supposed to be loving and caring. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember the, I don't know, it was last year or no. Well, we only did a park one year so far, or a parking year. They got one kid, he came on his bike, was really mad. He hollered at me about this church. Because he said, I, I tried to get help you, they won't help me, they won't help me. I don't know, I didn't do anything about it, but maybe he had gotten some help and he wanted more help. I don't know what the problem is. But you know, I, you just have to try to do the best you can. Okay? So he didn't bother to come to church, did he? No! <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, see, that's another thing. See, if, you, if somebody says, I'm really hungry, okay, well, I'll, I'll take you to McDonald's and get a burger. And, and then you can talk with them about Christ. But then they'll say, well, no, I, I'm really not hungry for a burger. But, you know, and then they can pass it all off. So it's really hard. Uh, I don't want us to be judgmental, but it is important to be helpful. That's why I think... If parents have a good relationship with their children, you know exactly. <laughs> and it's not the same for everyone. It's not the same for everyone. Okay. All right. Then, we've talked about this before, but it's still important. Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. And this is analyzing everybody through the cross of Christ. Again, you don't necessarily pronounce forgiveness upon one who has not repented, but you always treat them with forgiveness. You always treat them not seeking to get revenge. You always see them through the cross of Calvary. Very important. I mean, I don't know. It seems like, and I can pick on Germans, it seems like Germans have a good memory. And they can remember an episode in a voters meeting from 50 years ago. Nobody else remembers it. But boy, George, I'm not coming to church. I'll stay a member. But I'm not going to sit in the same pew with that person. Oh. The other person's in church. So who do you think's getting hurt? Duh. Okay, so forgive. Have this forgiving spirit. Kind hearted. Me. Humble. Above all else. Put on love. Okay, this is agape, the unselfish giving of oneself for the sake of the other. Uh, it's, it's what binds us together. Love, love. And, that, and this is, is, is the giving stuff. It's not the love of the world today. You tolerate everything. This is just the binding together in the love of Christ Jesus. Any thoughts or comments now? Are we... Still awake? <laughs> yes? The passage on verse 13 about, you know, we are to forgive because God forgives us. It's the fifth petition. Uh, it's the fifth petition. Um, yeah. And I, I tried to find it again because somebody had asked me in Bible study one week, because I taught Bible study one week, and next week he asked me about something about that, yeah. And I, the, the, Pastor Allmeyer had that particular service. I can't remember how the phrase went. I couldn't find that bulletin again. I, I, sh I showed it to him, but it was something about love flows through us. Okay, it, if we have God's love, it flows through us. If we have God's forgiveness, it flows through us. Because we know what forgiveness is. Forgiveness means you can't earn my favor. But I can grant you my favor. All right? God, we did not earn God's favor. God granted us his favor through forgiveness. And, and so to have that forgiving heart is just very, very important. Again, so much with resentment. So actually, in a, in a, I'll take this properly. In, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in essence, Alzheimer's can be pretty good. I forget. I forget the grudges. That's what I'm saying right I forget. We, so we should have a spiritual uh, Alzheimer where we just don't remember the wrongs. Okay? At least, especially to get even. It's just, you know, it just... Uh, I know, there's just so much heartache. I, except, 
I remember giving communion to somebody in Missouri. And, uh, well, he, he uh, had a stroke, and so he would blink his eyes to say, do you believe in Jesus? You know, are, are you repenting? He'd blink his eyes. And, but then his wife said that she would take him with him. And that, that congregation was so interrelated. And she, so she came up with something. She said, oh, yeah, I remember what somebody did. And I can forgive them, but I'll never forget it. And she raised her voice. I thought, oh, this is not forgiveness. Okay, not when you say it that way. Okay, but, you know, think about it. You and I have a clean slate with God. And God says, deal with one another. Forgiveness. Forgiving. Dealing to help them to grow to walk with Christ and all that. Okay? Not necessarily pronouncing forgiveness if they have not repented. Ready? Fifteen. A lot of stuff here. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to indeed, to which indeed you were called in one body. All right. Now it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. <laughs> in, in Greek, it kind of means God's peace is supposed to be our umpire. It governs. It rules. Um, so what's interesting is, see, we think peace can come. We think we can create peace by having rules, regulations, all this stuff. No. You can have all the rules and regulations you want. You're still not going to have peace. Peace is something that Christ gives us within, and then Christ gives, allows us and empowers us to share that peace with others. Okay? It comes again through the redeeming grace of God in Christ Jesus. I, I've always, well, you guys don't do it here, which is okay, because I, I didn't do it at Raven either, because I, I knew after a while that there were certain people who wouldn't sit next to certain people. And I was not about to do the handshake of peace and give them comfort saying, peace of the Lord be with somebody they already had peace with. Because what they should have done is gone over there and said, peace of the Lord to you. Okay. So it was like, that was almost like a rule, you know, with, let's have, share the handshake of peace now. And I'm not saying it's bad, but it can be hypocritical. If, I'm going to sh if I am going to share the handshake of peace, the first person I ought to go to is the person I have the least possibility of having peace with. Now that's a measure of it. It's not how much peace I share with somebody, you know. I, mean, I got peace with her. I tease her a lot, but I got peace with her. <laughs> <laughs> I should have. I should have said to her, "We're going to be sitting next to each other for five hours." Okay, no, I, I'm looking forward to this. Okay. Um, so, if, for example, in Romans one one, it says, "We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ." Okay, and again. It's so interesting that what Paul does is he puts Christ right in the middle of our relationship with one another. And have peace. See each other through Jesus Christ and his redeeming grace. Okay? Let there be thanksgiving. It's a present imperative. It means ever thankful. Not just thankful when you feel like it, but thankful all of us are. Uh, what is it, 1st Thessalonians, I think it's 1st Thessalonians 5.8, or 2nd Thessalonians 5.8, it's 1, it's 5 Thessalonians 5.8, but be thankful always. Okay, every situation. And what's, what's really interesting about that is, that means I know God's governing, even when things are going south, and I'm thankful. Uh, I don't know if I share this with you, but my daughter, bless her heart, my daughter, I don't like it. She, um, she wanted to do a half marathon. She, she hates running, absolutely hates running. Hates running so bad that when she prepared for the half marathon, she said, Dad, how do I breathe when I run? And I thought, what? Because she's a swimmer, and she can swim really well, and it doesn't breathe for a long time, whatever. She's a fish. And she said, how do you breathe running? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but she had to do a, a, a bike, swim and run. And she had her bike. She took it to the, it was at Potato Creek. 
She get, pulls the bike out and it's got a flat tire. <laughs> okay, so totally a flat tire. And people, other people were trying to help her. They couldn't find a tire, so she couldn't do the whole marathon. So she calls me up and she says, well, I did the swimming and I did the running, but I couldn't do the bike. I said, oh man, I, I'd be really upset by this. She said, well, Dad, you have to understand, it rained, the pavement was wet, and maybe God knew if I was going to ride my bike that day, I'd slip and fall. So he kept me safe. Thankful always. And I felt, oh man, she should be the pastor, not me. No. <laughs> Just a total understanding. Give thanks always, even when it's going bad. Okay? Get a prognosis from a doctor, and what does the Lord say? Be thankful always. That's trusting that God's governing all things. All right? So, and, and, and so we can encourage each other in that. Okay, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, verse 16. Let it live in you. It, it basically, it means here, let it inhabit your life and govern it. The word of God is in charge, not me. The word of God is in charge. And that really means knowing the Word of God and continuing to dwell therein and, and the like. And, uh, and, and the, the Lord will do that. Uh, uh, my first wife had a lump on her breast. Well, this is about an inch by a little bit. And I could feel it. And, and uh, so she was going to have a biopsy. The doctor was pretty sure it was cancer. And I woke up at 2 in the morning and I could not sleep. I was worried. I'm not going to just say I was deeply concerned. I was worried. And I sat down, got myself a cup of coffee, sat down, and I read that Bible for an hour. And finally, all of a sudden, the peace that surpasses all understanding came over me. This is not me doing this. And I literally could say, whatever happens, God, I know you're in control. Everything's all right. And I could thank you in that circumstance. Fortunately, when they did the biopsy, it was not cancer. <laughs> so I would have worried for how many days? Yeah, yeah, okay. 17, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then, uh, oh, no, it's still 16. And admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Okay? With thankfulness in your heart. Notice what it's saying here. Admon we admonish one another by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It reminds me. <laughs> well, Loretta, first of all, Loretta claimed me as that annoying singing pastor. Because I, I have this tendency, when I'm feeling really good, I'll sing all over the place. Not that it's good, but I'll sing. Awesome. So she'd say, oh, that annoying pastor is coming into the, this is before she knew who it was, annoying pastor is coming in singing at the top of his voice again. That's what she, well, you said that, I'm not lying. But you meant it kindly, I got that. But anyway, so anyway, one time there was this little preschooler, a member of our church, St. Paul's, and he comes up to me, and he was one of these serious little kids, you know. You could really have fun with him on our really And he said, he said, pastor, how come you're all singing? A wise old man, I said, did you ever see a bird cry? And he said, he says, stop it. Seriously, thought about it? No, I haven't. I said, that's because they always have a song in their heart. <laughs> and that's what Paul's saying here. Do you imagine, it's how uplifting it is when you hear a full congregation bellowing out the hymns. Huh? It feels like you're in heaven. We need to encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Okay, that's what Paul's saying here. That's this what, is our life. That's what bothers me about the churches that have these praise bands that oh. people don't sing hymns. Yeah, yeah. Because they're, they're denying their people that great pleasure. Right, yeah. Because it's a decent joy and happiness. Yeah. She's talking about praise bands here. Yes. And, and, and most of the time, I, I can tolerate some 
contemporary services, but most of the time, they're almost like a concert versus a worship service. They don't, you don't get into it because it's all new to you, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, th so think about this. When, this is what was being with Martin Luther. That's why he wrote hymns. So we would encourage one another. Okay, it's not just the pastor giving the people a sermon. It's us in the pew encouraging one another through singing and praying. This is important, okay? Because we got our, I, there's one I remember from when I took my daughter to uh, gymnastics. Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face because heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. Heaven is. <laughs> and she, if I brought that up right now, she still remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but it's, but we, those kind of spiritual uplifting time. Okay? Then uh, verse 17, uh, the whole concept here yet is God's word. Oh, I gotta be 17. Okay, let the word of God dwell in the law. With thankfulness in your hearts again to God. Um, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So this is kind of a conclusion of this all. What he's basically saying is. God's word is to encompass our thoughts, our words, our deeds. And our lives are to be a life of worship to Him. That's bearing fruit. Um, if you ask, if you were asked, where does worship take place? Where does worship of God take place? In your return or What? Every moment of every day. Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Again, written by Paul, so it's appropriate. Yes, it's a, I got a 947. Uh, Romans 12, verse 1. So it's interesting. So we talk and say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, no, but are you worshiping the Lord every day of your life? Okay? Because I've, I've, I've asked people to call me. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I said, so you, you're reading your Bible every day. Well, oh no. I should be, but oh no. See that right away. There, okay. But here it is. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, because of God's grace, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Spiritual worship is to be our entire life. It's not to be, I always tease the boys when they're ushering him. You know, I'll walk in and then I'll walk out and say, you checked me off, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going home now. I've been checked off. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but this is a, it's a big thing because there, when there's two concepts. There, those are, these are Lutheran words, you know. Uh, or I spoke more in the Lutheran church, I think, um, than other churches. But anyway, there is this. So what Paul has done is he says, first of all, you're justified. Uh, this is God's work alone in me. Or you, I'll put it. In us, that way. Okay? That's, we have nothing to do with justification. Okay? God chose us to be His own. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins. The Holy Spirit touched us through the waters of holy baptism and through the hearing of the Word. We have come to faith. This is all God's work. And now, justified, the Father declares us justified because of what Christ has done. So in, in the, I think it's, a, it's a Zechariah, no, I forgot, Zechariah, I think it's Zechariah. There's a court case, okay, so it's like the father's up here, uh, here's Satan, put that way, and here's Jesus, and we're on trial. Okay? And so, this is a 
tri- it's like a trial scene. Satan says, Father, you know what these people have done? And he starts listing the crimes. And boy, boy, they get long after a while. And all of a sudden, Jesus stands up and he says, Objection! I paid for all their sins. And the Father says, You're free. The seed. So it's, it's like Jesus is Perry Mason or Matt Locke. See, wins every case. Okay, so we stand justified. So this is all our doing. Here, God and us work together. God gives us the power, we use it. We bear fruit. Okay? And it should, it will normally come to us kind of unconsciously. You don't think about it. Maybe sometimes it was the old, say, oh, should I be doing this or not? And Satan's kind of, did you ever see the one with Urkel? Do you remember Urkel? What was it? I don't know, show. But it was Urkel, and he had, it was kind of funny. It was a devil Urkel on one shoulder and an angel Urkel on the other. And he was trying to make a decision. And sometimes we can be like that. And so sometimes there's that struggle, and, and God says, listen to me. Okay, follow me. So this is us working together. So this is what he's saying here, when he's saying, your whole life is to be honoring me. So we violate the third commandment when we don't live our lives to God's glory, because we're not really honoring the Lord on the Sabbath. Okay, check it off. Okay, and it's a really interesting. We check some off. I said, oh, we did a good one today. You just realize you, you destroyed meekness and compassion and humility, and, and that one's no good anymore. So what really happens, in, seriously, in our lives is we really never do a pure good work. But thank God, he always forgives us. Any thoughts? All right, you're still with me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know if I'm still with you. Okay. <laughs> Wait for vacation. Wait. Yes, with my beautiful bride. <laughs> you have that. Then. I will say this. Okay. Here we go. Now he comes, and it's interesting. Now he starts dealing with some personal relationships. Okay, so our whole life is supposed to glorify God. Now, let's get to brass tacks. How do husbands and wives get along? Okay, so first of all, he deals with husbands and wives here, okay? Talks about marriage. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Okay, first of all, he says wives, and he says... Wives are to submit to the Lord because that is fitting, or to husbands because that's fitting in the Lord. The, the verb tense is one that indicates that the submission is ever fitting. It's never, there's never a time where submitting to the husband is ungodly. Except it would be if, if I told Loretta I wanted a new car and she stole it. That would be because that's against God's will. But the concept here is ever submitting. Now, submission is to arrange an order, okay? This is not anything to do with inferiority or anything. It's, it's, it's to, to be harmonized, okay? It's, it's kind of like uh, when we got a second pastor, I said I, I, I was called the administrative pastor because the buck stops here. You can't have two people. I mean, you know, because if you have, it would be like if I all of a sudden I said to the Lord, I feel called by God to go to Alaska to open a mission there. Now she doesn't want to go, I want to, I think I'm called to go. What do we do? Pray about it. But ultimately, what the Lord does here is that in this order, He says, well, the husband, wife submits to the husband. Okay? 
until somebody has to make a final decision. My first wife used to say this to me. She said, Roger, I'm glad you have to make the final decision. Because if it's wrong, I can blame you. <laughs> she never had to worry. I mean, I didn't make, we mostly agreed on everything. But never had, she never had to worry because she was, she knew a concept was caring for her. It's a, what is a, a theologian said uh, from Genesis, he said, God didn't create woman from man's head so he would rule over her. So she would rule over him. Or from his feet so that he would stop on her. But he took it from the rib, which is where the heart is found, that she might always be loved and endeared. And that's the concept, okay? Because, oh, well, we can walk up to our question, finish this first. So it's not speaking about uh, inferiority of anything, but it's speaking about a voluntary act, and you're doing it to honor the Lord. Here again, it's worship. So if the wife displays this submission, submissive, submissive spirit, she is doing the will of God. Uh, she's submitting to his love and care. Now, it's always interesting to bring this up, people say, but what if, what if, especially wife? But then, notice the next one here. Husbands. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. This is agape love. And in Ephesians 5, 25, he, he emphasizes there, he says, uh, 5, 25, he writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So the love of a husband is to lay down his life for his wife. Just like Jesus laid his life down for us. When we protest what Jesus did for us, we would rather be submissive to him because we know of his love. And we know that that love is always going to take care of us. And so that's what it's talking about here. Uh, do, and, and therefore, do not be harsh with her. Do not treat her like a, a subject or an inferior person. What she's submitting to is the husband's love. Now, what's interesting about this, I, I find it interesting in a way, is when people come in with marital problems, how do you, what do you, th how, how do you think they talk about them? You ever think about that? Uh, every time it's happened. Like the politicians. Like politicians. <laughs> one of them, it doesn't matter which one, the same, but it's always the same story. I thought marriage was 50. I'm giving my half, but I'm not getting the other half. And so I'll listen for a while. I'll say, well, where'd you get it? I, it's 50-50. And we look at this passage, and I said, it's really 100-100. And if you're going to come in and complain about your marriage, you really should complain and say, I'm mad at my husband because he won't live, let me give my all to him. That's what you should be arguing about. But that, I've never heard that. I've never heard a husband say, I'm so mad at my wife, she just won't let me give my all to her. They don't do that. It's like 50-50. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. No wonder. They, see, they keep a track of a score again, okay? So anyway, this is the idea of, of she's submitting to the husband's love and headship, which represents Christ, okay? And so you're doing it in the name of the Lord. And, okay, again... You know, this doesn't mean that a man makes all the decisions. Or, I remember we, when we, uh, oh, my wife did a lot of gardening and stuff, and then we got to we'll get a half a side of beef from a farmer in Missouri. And, and uh, so we got a freezer, and I said, no, see, I'm practical. I'm just very practical. I'm always practical. Just know that. I said, no, I would choose a chest freezer because you, if you get more for your money. It's me. I said, but I know you're going to use it, dear, so whatever you decide. She wanted it upright because it, you know, she didn't want to dig way down. I thought I about that, you know. Because um, she was going to use it. Why should I tell her what she's going to use? I mean, that would be not appropriate. So we're talking about discussing and sharing and the like. So anyway, any comments? <laughs> All right, next one. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Okay, the Greek word here means listen to submissively. 
So you hear your parents and you're always submissive to them. Again, there's an exception. If your parent, Acts 5, 30, 29, if you, your parent says, I, we're sure the money will steal some apples, I must obey God rather than man. But otherwise, a child, and this is, this is for harmony. Did you ever, uh, I know we did this at St. Paul's, we had a, 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 a Bible study on marriage, and they used to use storms, right? Oh, there's a, a, a cold front coming in, there's a storm entering the house. Okay, because of irritability, uneasiness. And so when you think about this, because it pleases God, what, what God wants is harmony in the house. He said, here's the, you can have harmony. Okay, everybody's serving everybody, all right? Um, so that's children in everything, okay? And then, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So, how come did God forget there's usually two parents that bring forth children? How come he only has fathers here? What? Fathers are ultimately responsible for those children to God. Father, fathers are ultimately responsible. It comes Adam and Eve, right, in the garden? God went to Adam first. Hey man, you screwed up. No, you didn't. I didn't screw up. You did, God. You gave me that woman. Okay? Went down the line and everybody got punished. Okay? Okay. And it doesn't negate, this is the important part, it doesn't negate a mother's role by doing this. Uh, if you would, please turn to Proverbs 1. I just want to, because, honestly, and then when people would comment positively about our kids, I'd say, my wife is primarily responsible for it. Because she was with them all the time. I, I told her, right, I don't think I was home more than 10 times to put my kids to bed. I was always at church meetings. I was always, I was home for supper. I tried to come home a little early, play with them, eat supper, and then I'd go again. And, and, but she was the one who was basically nurturing them in the Christian faith on a daily basis. I wasn't always around. But Proverbs here, Proverbs um, 1, 8 and 9 says, Hear my son your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garment for your head, and pendants for your neck. So it's talking, of, a mother too does. And remember, who is a prime example of, uh, of mother's influence spiritually? Timothy, because Paul writes and says uh, to Timothy, your mother and your grandmother. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting because I look at my life too, and, and uh, my, mo my mom was probably the, the more, my dad was spiritual too, but my mom somehow coordinated it very effectively in daily life. Okay. Um, anyway, so uh, fathers are not to bring inconsiderate, unjust, or wrong treatment upon their children. Um, and Ephesians six four also remember it says, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So the fathers still. And this is when I look at our society. This is the greatest weakness. The family has fallen apart, and nobody. But nobody can replace a mom and dad. Nobody. And that's the thing with politics today. They don't address the family issues. It's, okay, the government will help you now, or the government will mm -hmm. subsidize you, or, you know, it's, or, that's what they're pushing. They don't say, let's try to rebuild families, and yeah. let's keep the father at home. Or, you know. Well, even the edu whole educational process goes back to the home. I mean, you can have... Kids, I, you see that with confirmation. You always tell the kids that are going to live out their confirmation vows, but it always comes from a family that is doing that. The ones that weren't. And then it's also interesting, another interesting insight that, that has occurred to me. I, first of all, evangelism. If you evangelize, you can get a woman to join the church far easier than a man. Yeah. 
But if you get the man of the household, then you have the family. And then I've statistically I've watched this at St. Paul's and stuff, where there's a, a father that doesn't go to church and a mother that does. Generally, the kids don't. Generally, um, you can take that for what you want. But um, anyway, ready? Okay. I was waiting. Okay, let's do this last one here. We're going to do this last one. We're going to go through 4 1. I think we can do this. So, now I want you to notice this. This is kind of interesting. Um, he's talking about relationships, right? So, the wife gets one verse, the husband gets one verse, the children get one verse, the fathers get one verse. And then there's 22, 23, 24, 25, and verse 1. Five verses on masters and slaves. Why is that? Are, are masters and slaves more important than wives or husbands or children or fathers? No. What's the situation that Paul's dealing with here, connected with this? We talked a little bit about this before. There's another person that he's going to be sending these letters to. Oh. Go ahead. You remember? Is he yes. Onesimus has run to Rome. He's, gone, he's been converted by Paul to Christianity. And now Paul is sending him back to Philemon. And this is a big challenge, okay? And so in, in this realm of all of these different teachings, the length of instruction here is dealing, this is an important one, because he does, Paul doesn't really condone slavery, but he doesn't say it's bad, he just, this is what, how you deal with the situation. Now obviously we're going to deal with it as worker and employer. Employee, employer. Go ahead, Art. No, it's just okay. a relationship. Between them. It is a relationship, right, uh-huh. Yes. So, so we read, slaves obey in everything those who are your earthly ma masters. Not only by, of, with, not only not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Now notice here what he says to the worker. He says, your service should not be token service. Your service and commitment to your employer shouldn't be going on only when your employer is there. It's when he's not there, okay? Because you're going to supposed to be doing it with a sincerity of heart. Because when you're working, you're working unto the Lord. Okay, so when you're doing dishes, well, we won't, well, we have dishwashers usually now, but whatever, we've got to put in the dishwasher. You're doing it unto the Lord. Okay, everything we do is to be done unto the Lord to honor Him. And you think about that if we, you know, again, I just. Keep on thinking about take a shower all the time. Man, I'm sure glad I don't have to heat water and pump it up and bring it in. I would never take a shower. <laughs> but 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 you think about these things. And so you gotta clean the shower. Oh man, I gotta clean the shower. Well, you gotta shower. Thank God we can not have to haul in the water, okay? So the concept here is is be thankful, give glory to God by the way you work for your uh, and it's to be done out of fear for God, which really means respect. I'm respecting God, who gave me this position, who gave me this opportunity to make a living. I, I'm, I'm going to live to honor Him. Okay? And then you've got, um, it, it sounds uh, very much like verse 17 again. Uh, uh, where is it? Whatever, verse 23, whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So this is really to be the model of our lives. Okay, is that with regard to service, we don't we're not serving the boss. We are serving the Lord. So whatever you do, 
encompasses anything. Work hard at it. Give it your all, as for the Lord and not men. Okay, the number one boss we have, God. Okay, and like the, the uh, oh, okay, what did I do with this? The, um, when you go into the fourth commandment, you have like God here, and uh, pastors, teachers, parents, oh, government, and I have to stop there. Oh, I shouldn't go. And employers, okay? And so these are God's representatives. So this is how I always did this with the kids. Okay. It's a mess, isn't it? And this is all fit in. Okay. That's good with the stuff. And it all comes down. What it, what it is saying is, God is the boss, and yet on earth, he gives us pastors, teachers, parents, government, employees, whatever else, you're, employers, whatever else you want. They are God's representatives on earth, and we are to obey them, for in obeying them, we obey God. But we have this channel here, because again, if uh, one of these would say, I want you to go and knock off so and so. They're out of, uh, they're outside the representation of God. Okay, but otherwise, these people represent God, and so it's a big thing to respect your parents. It's a big thing to respect your employer. Now, again, I, we had one member. I remember he uh, he worked in shipping, and uh, all of a sudden the boss said, "I want you." to put less of a number of items received than we really got. And when we ship out, I want you to put uh, more of the number out than we're sending out. So he quit. He said, this isn't God made anymore. He lost $5,000 a year in five weeks vacation and didn't have a job. But God was his boss. He got another job. But, I mean, that's, that's the implications, okay? Um, okay. So, um, I'd like to read 2 Corinthians 5 here. Once more, this is this whole idea of our whole life being governed by God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, 66, uh, 5, 14, and 15. For the love of Christ compels us. So, God's love is what moves us to live the way we do. It's not self, it's God's love. God's love has given us new life in Christ. For the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live, those who are alive in him, might no longer live for themselves but for him who uh, for their sake, died and was raised. So the whole concept is found the sanctification. He made us his own. Now we live our all for him. All right. All right. And now 24. Going back here. We're going to finish this up. 24. Knowing, oh, yes, knowing. The word knowing in 24 is. You have come to that knowledge. And the verb tense says you have come to that knowledge. In other words, you have, I'll use for lack of that, received Christ. You know who Christ is. You know the inheritance that you have. You have reached that part in your faith life. So now, it's like what we had talked about before. We don't live for this life anymore. We live for eternity. Okay? Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So keep on serving the Lord Christ. Uh, the whole idea uh, would be in a, a Romans, not Romans, a Revelation 2.10. Uh, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Bear fruit for me, and you know where you're going. 
Keep your sights on the temporal, not the eternal. I mean, yeah, the eternal, not the temporal. One other item here about this kind of, this kind of interesting was translated in 24, then we'll stop. You are serving the Lord Christ literally. If you're going to translate literally, it should be, for the Lord keeps serving. It's a command. It, the way it's read in the book, you are serving the Lord Christ is not a command. It's an imperative there, so it should be read, for the Lord, keep serving. Keep serving for the Lord. Okay, it's a better translation. And then 25 simply reminds us that the day of judgment is coming. And uh, remember the reward. Which is not reward, really, it's a gift, right? Okay. We'll wait for Masters until next time. That way I can boss you around. Oh, all right. <laughs> I think it's good. Okay, any other thoughts or comments you got today? All right, I got this. I'm going to mark this. This is, was my. One of my downfalls as a pastor, I never marked where I stopped. And then, it, like, I was like, every week I'd ask him, where did I stop? That's why I got married. <laughs> I needed to stop. <laughs> I just, oh my goodness, okay. Let's, let's close with, let's close with, uh, let's close with a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.